Ну, если совсем брать простой ответ. The obvious answer is that the Soviet power is the power of Soviets, power of councils. We need to clear out what Soviets are. If we take the word Soviet councils for granted, then we are enjoying the Soviet power to the full extent now. We have got research councils, we got state council headed by the president of Russia, we've got federal council. If we just snatch the word Soviet Council, then we can see that we've got art councils, human rights council, etc. Therefore, one might think that we're still having Soviet power because Soviet councils are everywhere around us. Everyone is counseling and just giving advice without doing anything real. If we take this path, judging by, just by words, we will not make it out what Soviet power is. So we need to get away from superficial meaning and find out what Soviets mean as historical and political reality. Soviets take their origin from strike actions of workers in ivanovo Vaznistensk. Also, such industrial protest manifestations occurred in 32 other cities in Russia in 1905. Thus, on the rebound of striking movement, the working class of Russia, not a party of some ideologist or any theory maker, the workers themselves started creating the regulatory body. This regulatory body was assembled from authorities of strike committees. This regulatory body had huge power because upon the decision of strike committee all industrial process was stopped in the whole city. This decision was unanimously implemented. Representatives of the body were not elected on territorial principle. No voting of locals. This body was created by workers of a particular plant or a particular factory. Such bodies that had been created in factories and in plants and had gained real power, such bodies were called Soviets or councils. Such Soviets appeared in 1905 in ivanovo Vaznesensk. It was an outstanding discovery of Russian workers, discovery of Russian working class. This discovery had worldwide historic importance. No other country had neither made this discovery nor managed to copy it, however attempts were made. The second remake of Soviets appeared in 1917 when bourgeoisie decided at last to snatch the governmental power. Peasants had been set free by Tsar himself in 1861. Still, Russian bourgeoisie hesitated whether it should take the power from aristocracy. The economy of Russia was capitalist in the 19th century. In the beginning of the 20th century, our capitalist economy was developing into monopoly power. Nevertheless, governmental power still belonged to the feudal class. Finally, the bourgeoisie came up to the Tsar and told him to abdicate the throne. The state of affairs in economics and in politics of Russia was such that the abdication of the Tsar happened almost without any victims. The Tsar abdicated in his brother Mikhail's favor. Mikhail abdicated too. Therefore, Tsar family stopped to exist. There was no Tsar family anymore, and nobody killed it because there was no such family then. It was not a Tsar family, but a civic one. So Soviets appeared. By the way, at first the Soviets were ruled by the Fair Russia Party and by Menshevik Party. You might not believe me, but Kerensky used to be the chairman of the first Petrograd Soviet. Genius of Lenin was that he discerned in these Soviets, notwithstanding their antagonistic nature towards the working class, he discerned that these bodies could become organs of the future working class power. Why so? Because it is quite easy to dismiss a member of this body. If our plant has elected you, it will be easy to dismiss you. We just need to get together and decide that tomorrow Petrov will replace Ivanov. The Soviet would not object to, to changing of the representative of a particular factory. For example, Kirov plant used to have four representatives, four deputies in the Soviet. Workers elected them and sent them to the Soviet. They had the power to dismiss a deputy at any moment. So there was a period in the history of our country when it was possible to dismiss from power those people who wouldn't defend the interests of common working people. 
This was demonstrated in September 1917. After Kornilov's mutiny, Bolsheviks acquired great respect. Soviets were re-elected, and in the army troops of the North Front Line in Petrograd and in Moscow, the Soviets consisted of the Bolsheviks. These were the Soviets that took the power from bourgeoisie in October 1917. After these events, unfortunately, this wasn't fixed in such documents as the constitutional law. The constitution ran like this. In the village territory, one representative is elected by 125,000 inhabitants. In other cities, one representative is elected by 125,000 electors. We can see that the word elector for cities implied that elections were made according to the staff of plants and factories, not according to territory. But this implication wasn't so easy to make out. There existed an instruction for elections. It was published in Narodna Pravda paper of 1926. You can find this text on the website of Worker Class Academy Foundation. The deputies were to be elected at the meetings. At least 35% of the working staff of the plant or factory were to be present. Later, when the principle of elections was changed, 90% or even 100% of the electors were to be present. When election is going on at the plant, you can't have 90% of electors present. The plant has got shifts when some people leave home. One third of electors is quite enough because workers tend to think that if one third of them decide so and so, then all of them take that decision. All the elections can also be made via labor unions. This can be used for small working groups like snack bars, beauty shops, etc. If one doesn't get to the labor union there, one doesn't get to the power. Each working member of the society can t par take part in the elections either by attending the election meeting at the factory or via labor union, or as an exception, via local election. Every working person had a right to vote. This was fair. Why should the society give the right to vote to those who don't work? Of course, this concerned people who lived by vicarious labor, nor, not people who were sick or who stayed under care. That was Soviet power as it was. How long did it exist? It existed until 1936. Therefore, if people say that they were living under Soviet power, it is not so. I am 67 years old. I was born in 1945. I never lived under Soviet power. Neither did those who were born in 1944 and so on. This wasn't Soviet power, but it was socialist power. The proletarian dictatorship was implemented via the party. Plants and factories did suggest the deputies for this, but these deputies were elected according to territorial principles, similar to parliamentarian elections. This made it possible that Gorbachev managed to do it so that not plants and factories, but cinema goers' associations, philatelic societies, various other social associations suggested their candidates. After that, they claimed all power to the councils and destroyed the socialist power. Those so-called Soviets or councils were not Soviets anymore. The name of Soviet was preserved in the title Supreme Soviet since 1936, but it was not a Soviet. I will quote Kozma Prudkov, Russian satiric writer. If you see a label buffalo on a cage with an elephant, then do not believe your eyes. What was the worst in it all? That no one could be dismissed anymore. The system of elections was multi-step. First, plants and factories selected their deputies into the city council. The city council elected their deputies into the Congress of Soviets. The Congress of Soviets elected their representatives into the Central Executive Committee. When Soviets existed, it was easy for workers of a plant to dismiss their deputy. If this deputy stopped being strenuous worker or if he started to despise his colleagues, ignored their interests, workers could gather a meeting and call him back. The constitution made after 1936 did not comprise this law. 
Due to that, the government governing apparatus got systematically infected with ladder climbers. The word nomenclature used to be a normal word. The party should observe the stocklets of its officials so that greasers can't creep into it. By the by, this word became pejorative because the highest ranks of the party became filled with people who were sure that they would never fall down. Uncountable quantities of Gorbachevs filled the party at all levels. Gorbachev is a type, it's not just one person, such people were everywhere at all levels. They were so numerous that they throttled the power of working class and thus the power degenerated. I can't say that Soviet power will save the state of affairs all by itself. No system, no form will save us unless there is no struggle of working class and its adherers. Unless you do struggle, the power will be snatched from you. Thus, if you have obtained the power, you should go happy ever after. You shouldn't go happy ever after with it. You should take double effort to re reach the goals that you have set. With the goals realized in 1936. Socialism has just been settled. Socialism is the lowest part phase of communism, or in other words, it was communism in its lowest phase. Still, full development of human personalities wasn't obtained because many jobs were time consuming and difficult. Feeding wasn't sufficient, not all people had a proper place to live. Nevertheless, the proletarian dictatorship managed to make a huge progress in many aspects, even after the Soviets ceased to be bodies of real Soviet power. In Lenin's works, there is a saying that if we are thrown away at the parliamentarian level, we will never reject that. We will always strive for having Soviet power. Lenin saw the future as the international Soviet Republic ruled by the proletariat of all countries. This can be the answer to the question, what are Soviets like?